We welcome in everyone who's part of the E-Free Church family who are watching literally from all over. We welcome in our Sault Ste. Marie campus. We welcome in the classic service down in the chapel. We welcome in our church online watching from all over literally the world. We welcome our TV audience. Those listening right now on the Eagle 101.5 FM, welcome. And, uh, and those are part of different watch groups. Uh, We have watch groups to meet in Charlevoix and Harbor Springs, out on Bois Blanc Island, and we have a group of young, energetic people at the Tall Timber Church down in Silver Springs, Florida, who watch every Sunday, and I know they're energetic because I have a spy there. And she sends me videos of their worship and their special music, and uh, so we welcome them in as well. Now, if you're a first-time guest, we especially want to welcome you. And uh, up at our Sioux campus, I know Jeff would say the same thing. After the service, my number one goal, and I know it's Jeff's goal up at our Sioux campus, is to personally meet every first-time guest. So if you're a first-time guest, would you do us a favor here or at our Sioux campus? Would you fill out one of those tickets that's in front of you? Hang on to it. When the service is over up at our Sioux campus, if you're a first-time guest, Jeff will be standing in the back. Please take it to him. He'd love to meet you. Here at our Gaylord campus, my wife and I will be out in what we call the hub. It's right out by the cafe. You can't miss us. And if you're a first-time guest, please bring that card up to us. Even if you have to wait in a little bit of a line, we would love to meet you, connect with you give you a gift our way of saying thank you for being our guest today well today i want to begin our time in the word by reading a passage from revelation chapter one and uh, and this is a passage that describes the apostle john being taken up in a vision to heaven where he's able to see the resurrected christ and he sees them in an amazing way and i want to read the description and there's a lot in that description we're not going to talk about it because what i really want us to get to is john's response to what he sees and jesus response to john's response all right So let me read Revelation 1, beginning in verse number 12. Listen to what John says. He says, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man. That's Christ. The resurrected, glorified Christ. Clothed in a robe, reaching to the feet. Girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like wool, like snow. And his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars. And out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in its strength. And now we get to the part I want us to look at. And John says in verse 17, When I saw him... I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he, Jesus, placed his right hand on me. Which is biblical proof you cannot be like Jesus and be left-handed. Just joking. (laughs) And he said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last and the living one. And I was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. Now, from that response that Jesus gives back to uh, to John, I want us to see three things about Jesus. I want us to see the comfort of the resurrected Christ. I want us to see the character of the resurrected Christ. And I want us to see the conquering of the resurrected Christ. Let's start with the comfort. 
Because John, seeing Jesus in this way, is filled with fear. He's paralyzed with fear. John's never seen Jesus like this. I mean, he saw Jesus during the earthly ministry. He even saw Jesus on the cross. He saw Jesus in his bodily form after his resurrection. He even got a glimpse of the glory of Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration one day. But he had never seen Jesus like this. And the result is he is filled with fear. John isn't in a glorified body yet. He doesn't have a glorified mind yet. And notice how Jesus responds to him. Jesus comforts him in two ways. First, he comforts him with a touch. I love that. He reaches out and he touches him. You know, this had to bring back a memory to John. Because when John and his brother James and Peter were with Jesus one day on the Mount of Transfiguration, they got to see a glimpse of Jesus' glory. They even heard the audible voice of God saying, this is my beloved son, follow him. And they were filled with fear then. And you know what Jesus did to them then? Well, in the book of Matthew, chapter 17 We read, when the disciples heard this, the voice of God, they fell down to the ground and were terrified. And Jesus came to them and touched them and said, get up. Don't be afraid. When you follow the life of Jesus in the Bible, you know you discover? Jesus often touched people. In fact, you went to a fascinating study. Read through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Make a note of every time Jesus touches someone. My favorite one happens in Mark chapter 1. When a leper comes up to Jesus, a man that had leprosy. Now, back in that day, they didn't know a lot about leprosy. And back in that day, they believed it was highly contagious. And if you ever got diagnosed with leprosy, you were banished from society. You were not allowed to be around people, and you certainly couldn't touch or be touched by people. Now, I don't know how long this man had been diagnosed with leprosy, maybe months, maybe years. But however long it had been, it had been that long since he felt a compassionate human touch. And look what happens in Mark chapter 1, verse 40. A leper came to Jesus, beseeching him, falling on his knees before Jesus and saying, If you are willing, Jesus, you can make me clean. And I love verse 41. Moved with compassion, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him. And said, I'm willing, be cleansed. Now let me ask you a question. Did Jesus have to touch the leper to heal him, yes or no? No. He could have just spoke the word. He could just thought the thought. But instead, before he heals him, he chooses to reach out, moved with compassion, and touch him. And I have to think that that human touch meant more to that leper than even his healing. Now, folks, Jesus hasn't changed. I got good news for you today. The resurrected, ascended, glorified Jesus wants to touch you today. No matter where you are. You might be sitting in one of our campuses. Jesus wants to touch you. You may be watching from home. A nursing home, a hospital. We have many that watch us from prison. You might be in a restaurant. The very first person who ever came to know Jesus through our TV ministry did so watching us while eating an egg McMuffin at McDonald's. We call that McVangelism. <laughs> but no matter, maybe you're driving your car right now, listening to us on the Eagle 101.5 FM. I want you to know something. On this special day, the resurrected, ascended, glorified Jesus wants to touch you with a touch of compassion. He already has many of you. 
Just as you have experienced the worship this morning, you have felt the touch of the Spirit of God. He wants to touch you. But he didn't just comfort John with a touch. He also comforted him with a truth. He said, do not be afraid. Literally, it's translated, stop being afraid. And I wonder if that's what Jesus wants to say to many of you today. Because maybe today you're dealing with some fear. Maybe the fear deals with your marriage. Maybe the fear deals with your finances. Maybe the fear deals with your physical condition. And Jesus says to you, stop being afraid. It's the most often repeated command in all the Bible. So we see the comfort of the resurrected Jesus. Notice, secondly, the character of the resurrected Jesus. He says... After he said, do not be afraid, he said, I am the first and the last and the living one. Now, this is about all three of those phrases. I am the first and the last, the living one. All three communicate the same thing. Jesus Christ is God. That's what he communicates. My wife and I, uh, before we go to bed at night, which means we have to do it before nine o'clock. But my wife and I like to watch some of the old TV shows. And, uh, and so uh, a lot of nights we will watch the Newhart show. Bob Newhart. Love that show. Or one of my old-time favorites, Benson. Did any of you remember watching Benson? Great show. But last night we watched an episode of, wait for it, Mork and Mindy. If you remember Mork and Mindy, Nanu, Nanu, you remember what the great show that was, don't you? And the show we watched last night was the Christmas episode one season. And Mindy is trying to explain to Mork, who is an alien who is spending his first Christmas on Earth, what Christmas is all about. And she says to him, and I was really pleased at first, she said, it's all about celebrating a man that lived named Jesus. I thought, oh, that's good. Got my attention. And then she said this, because Mark said, who was Jesus? She said, well, he was a good man who did a lot of really good things. Boy, was I disappointed. Because, ladies and gentlemen, if the only thing you know about Jesus is he was a good man, and he was, and he did a lot of really good things, and he did, but if that's all you know about Jesus... You don't know Jesus. He's God. He said, I am. That was an Old Testament covenant name for God. Remember when Moses is being spoken to by God on the burning bush? And Moses says, whom shall I say sent me? And the voice who was God said to him, you tell them, I am sent you. He says, I am the first of the last. In other words, there was nothing before me and there'll be nothing after me. I'm eternal. He's God. And then he says, I'm the living one. And that would have echoed the words that Peter would have said the day when Jesus said, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the living one, the son of God. In other words, in contrast to every other God in the world that is a dead God, you are the only living God. So we see the character of Jesus. But here's the part I really want to get to. We see the conquering of Jesus. He says this. I was dead. And behold. I am alive. Forevermore. So what words does Jesus use. To bring comfort. To John. He says I am the one. Who died. And I am the one. Who rose again. Now, those two facts about Jesus become paramount because that is what the Bible calls the good news. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Paul says, I make known to you, brethren, the gospel. Now, that's a word we don't use much today in normal conversation, but it was a word back then that simply meant good news. That's what it meant. He said, I now present to you the good news. 
And down in verse 3, he says, let me tell you what that good news is. He says, for I delivered to you as of first importance. Now, don't miss this. The word gospel means good news. But according to Paul, this is the first good news. In other words, there is no good news that's gooder than this. This is the goodest good news you could ever hear. And this week I'll find out how many English teachers are watching us today. But this is the goodest good news. And what is it? That Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture, was buried and was raised on the third day, according to scripture. So what is the goodest good news we could ever hear? Number one, Christ died for our sins. Now, if you were here Good Friday, what a special service we had Good Friday. We looked at the verse that helped us to understand what this aspect of the good news is. It's in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, where it says, For Christ died, number one, for sins. Number two, once for all. Number three, the just for the unjust. And number four, so he might bring us to God. What makes the death of Jesus the goodest good news you could ever hear? Well, number one, his death was sacrificial. That's what separated his death from every other death. You see, if it was just Christ died, there's really no reason to have a holiday. There's really no reason to get together if it's just Christ died. Millions of men have died. In fact, Statistics, recent statistics tell us one out of every one person dies. One scientific study showed everyone who eats meatloaf dies. That's why I don't eat meatloaf. Just the fact that Christ died means nothing. What separated the death of Jesus from every other death? His is the only death that was made to be a penalty, to pay a penalty for our sin. The only one. Jesus' death did something no other death could do. Listen, it paid the penalty for sin. But not only was it a sacrificial death, it was a sufficient death. He died for sins once for all. He died one time for all sin. Nothing else has to be done. There's nothing else we can do. Jesus doesn't have to die again. It was sufficient. And not only that, it was substitutionary. It says he died the just for the unjust. He was perfect. He had no sin. The Bible says God made him who knew no sin to become sin for us. Jesus doesn't die to pay the penalty for his sin. He's perfect. God put our sin on him. And God punished him not for his sin, but for our sin. And then it says, his death brings salvation. That he might bring us to God. You might remember that back in John chapter 14, Jesus made an incredible statement. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father unless they come through me. The Bible says he that has the Son, Jesus, has eternal life. Why? Why is Jesus the only way? Answer, because he's the only one who paid the penalty for our sin in full so that we don't have to ourselves. That's why. Nobody else can say that. And the only way I can have a relationship with God, the only way I can know for sure I'm going to heaven is to put my faith in what Jesus did. I can't do it on my own. Doing a bunch of good things isn't going to cut it. That's not going to get me to heaven. Going through religious rituals, classes, that's not going to get me to heaven. Attending church, Not going to get me to heaven. Giving money in the offering. Not going to get me to heaven. But please don't let that stop you. (laughs) Getting baptized. Not going to get me to heaven. The only way I'm going to get to heaven. Is by putting my faith. 
in the fact that Jesus paid the penalty for my sin so that I don't have to. He died to bring salvation. So one aspect of the goodest good news you could ever hear, Christ died for our sins. The other aspect of the goodest good news you could ever hear, he rose again on the third day. Now, let's talk about that for a second. Because Jesus wasn't the first person to be resurrected, was he? No, he wasn't. Remember Lazarus? Back in John chapter 11, he'd been dead for four days. Jesus came to his tomb. Jesus stood outside his tomb. Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came out of the tomb. So Jesus wasn't the first one to be resurrected. There were many others in the Bible. So what makes the resurrection of Jesus special? What makes it different than, say, Lazarus? And here's the answer. Jesus was the first person to be resurrected, never to die again. That wasn't true of Lazarus. I hear people talk about Lazarus and they go, man, how lucky is Lazarus? He got to be resurrected. And I'm going, I'm not sure that was good luck. I mean, think about it. Lazarus dies. What's that mean? His soul leaves his body. His body's in the tomb. His soul is now in paradise. It is in a place of total bliss, total blessing, total comfort, total joy, total peace. He has been there four days going, this is the best vacation I've ever had. And suddenly an angel taps him on the shoulder and says, "Um, Laz, I got some bad news for you. You have to go back. He's going, what? And live with my sisters again? Really? What? I'm not sure that was a good deal for him. And not only that, you know what else? That old boy had to die a second time. How about you? I'm not looking forward to doing that once, let alone twice. Jesus' resurrection is different. He's the first one to be resurrected, never to die again, which is why he said... I am alive forevermore. But then he said something else. Fascinating. He said, and I have the keys of death and of Hades. I have the keys. Now, it's important you understand something. It's important that you understand that these aren't literal keys. Keys in the Bible represents authority. They're not, he, he doesn't have literal keys that jingle. Okay, Jesus isn't like, remember the custodian at your school back when you were in school? You always knew when the custodian was coming down the hallway because he had a, a, a ring about a hundred keys that just jingled as he walked. Remember that? Some of you have some on your belt right now. That wasn't, that, that, we're not talking about literal keys. It represents authority. Now this is important because there's teaching that happens this time of year that's very incorrect it's a teaching that says when Jesus died in between his death and his resurrection he descended into the flames of hell where in this WWE style cage match he wrestles Satan and takes the keys away from him that did not happen number one the keys aren't physical literal keys and number two folks Satan isn't in hell today. Please don't get your theology from Far Side Comics. He's not in hell today. Some people believe Satan is kind of the guy in charge in hell. And if you die as an unbeliever, you go to hell. He assigns you your room. He's not there yet. Revelation chapter 20 verse number 10 says there will be a day he'll be thrown in there. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire. Jesus did not go down into the flames of hell and wrestle keys away from Satan. It simply means this. Listen, through his death for our sins and his resurrection never to die again, Jesus took authority over death back. That's what it means. You see... When Satan tempted Adam and Eve and they fell into sin, and that sin passed upon all men, the outcome was that every person is born separated from God, deserving of punishment, 
undeserving of heaven. Death was a horrible thing. But when Jesus died for our sins and rose from the dead, he took authority over death back. Look what it says in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, Jesus himself likewise partook of the same. He became a man. That through death, look, he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is the devil. He no longer has the power over death. Now, that authority belongs to Jesus. And because of that, four things happen when we put our faith in the fact that Jesus died for our sins and rose from the dead. Four things happen. Number one, we who were spiritually dead now have spiritual life. We were born spiritually dead, separated from God because of a sin nature that we all had, still do. But when we put our faith in Jesus, he made us spiritually alive. Look at Ephesians 2 verse 4. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, he made us alive together with Christ. And how did he do it? Not by our good works, not by our church attendance, not by our baptism. He did it by grace. He gave us what we didn't deserve. We didn't deserve spiritual life. We didn't deserve to have a relationship with God. We don't deserve heaven. But when we put our faith in him, because he died for our sins and rose from the dead, never to die again, he takes we who were spiritually dead and makes us spiritually alive. And now we have a relationship with God and we have the assurance of heaven. Because he took authority back. There's a second result for those who put their faith in Jesus. Not only do you become spiritually alive, but number two, when we die physically, meaning our soul leaves our body, right? Our body dies, our soul, the real us, lives on. When we die physically, our soul immediately goes into the presence of the Lord. And that's exactly what Paul taught in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. When he says, we are of good courage and prefer rather to be absent from the body, that's death, our soul leaves our body, so that we can be present with the Lord. If you've attended E3 for any stretch of time, you've heard me make this phrase almost every sermon. If you have put your faith in Jesus, you can be assured of this. Your last breath on earth will become your first breath in heaven. And for you, it will be spectacular. And the reason that's true is because Christ died for our sins, rose from the dead, never to die again, and took authority back over death. There's a third thing, a third result. Though our body dies, it will one day be resurrected our soul immediately goes to heaven not our body right our body we either are buried or maybe we're cremated and 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 our ashes something done with our ashes yeah i've been thinking a lot about that like if i if they cremate me what do i want done with my ashes you ever thought that morbid thought right i'm thinking maybe they could just scatter them right up here and put a rug over them and i could always be here when people are preaching you know or better yet, maybe we could get a specially made urn, put my ashes in it that fit into Michael's guitar. So every time he plays, he's holding me. What, that, what, that, I don't know. But here's what I do know. Doesn't matter what you do with my ashes or my body. Doesn't matter. Here's why. Because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, behold, I tell you a mystery. Something that used to be hidden that's now been revealed. We won't all sleep. Our bodies won't stay dead. But we will all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye. Not in the blink of an eye. In the twinkling of an eye. Do you realize? You twinkle quicker than you blink. I got to be careful how I say that. (laughs) Let me just keep reading. At 
the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound. The dead will be raised imperishable. We will be changed for this perishable. We'll put on imperishable. The mortal will put on immortality. Listen, don't miss this. Because you put your faith in Jesus, because he died for your sins and rose from the dead, though your soul immediately goes to be with God in heaven when you die, one day he will resurrect your body. It will be changed into a perfect body, never to die again that's why this is the goodest good news you could ever hear and then the fourth result in heaven we will never experience death again I get asked all the time about heaven will this be in heaven will that be in heaven will we do this in heaven in fact I read a story this week of a guy who his passion was baseball. And I can relate. That's why I call my, I can relate to that. I love baseball. I'm glad the season started. And, uh, and so he prayed over and over, God, I need to know, is there baseball in heaven? Please give me a sign. And, and God kind of got tired of hearing from him. It's not a theologically correct story. And, and, and God sent an angel to give him the answer. And the angel said, I'm here to give you the answer on if there's baseball in heaven. And the guy said, great, is there? The angel said, well, there's, there's good news and there's bad news. And the guy said, well, what's the good news? He said, the good news is yes. There is baseball in heaven. And because it never gets dark in heaven and the weather's always perfect, there is baseball going on 24 hours a day, seven days a week in heaven. The guy's like, this is great. What could be the bad news? He said, you're scheduled to pitch on Thursday. Okay, that, that's the bad news, all right? But we do learn something incredible about heaven. Look at this. John gets a glimpse of heaven. And part of the description, he says this in Revelation 21, verse 3. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold... The tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they will be his people, and God will be among them, and listen, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. I have one suit it's my funeral suit kind of weird it's also my wedding suit I do both with it (laughs) and if the staff anybody ever sees me in my suit they know probably have a funeral today don't you I won't need a funeral suit in heaven you see Jesus took authority back and when we put our faith in the fact that he died to pay the penalty for our sin and rose again never to die again the bible says we go from being spiritually dead to spiritually alive and when we die our soul immediately goes into the presence of god And one day our very bodies will be resurrected and changed into perfect bodies never to die again. And once we get to heaven, we will never, ever, ever see death again. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the goodest good news your ears could ever hear. Would you bow with me for a moment of prayer? With our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Have you made that decision of faith? To put your faith in the fact that Jesus died for your sins and rose from the dead? Because if you haven't, or you're not sure you have, the Bible says whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And you can do that right now, wherever you are. There's no magical words. You can just in your heart, God hears your thoughts. Say, Jesus, I do believe you died for my sins. I do believe you rose from the dead. I believe you're the only way to heaven. And I put my faith in you. And the Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord 
will be saved. Maybe this morning, you've made that decision before, but you know you've not been living all in for Jesus. Maybe this morning, you just need to rededicate your life to Christ. You can do it right where you're seated. Right where you're seated, you can say, Jesus, I put my faith in you, but I haven't been living all in for you. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Today, I recommit my life to you. Would all of you look up at me, please? This morning, I want you to know that I have found in my life, whenever I make a decision of faith, if I keep it a secret, I often don't follow through. But if I share it with somebody, I'm more likely to follow through. I'd like to give you that opportunity. I'm not going to ask you to come forward, nothing like that. But if you just made a decision for Jesus today, whether you're here at our Gaylor campus, up at the Sioux campus, watching online, on TV, listening on radio, whatever. If you just made a decision to either put your faith in Jesus or recommit your life, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Just take out your phone. In fact, not everybody just take out your phone. That way no one feels funny. Just take out your phone. And, but if you made a decision, I'd like you to text the word victory to this number. 989-623-4779. Text the word victory to 989-623-4779. Here's what will happen. What's going to happen is you're going to get a link that will just ask you for your name and email. You fill that out, and every day for seven days, starting tonight, every day for, and I promise you, it ends after seven days, I promise you. You will get an email from me, and each day will give you a next step that you can take in your walk of faith. No one's going to call you. No one's going to show up at your door. I pro- you have my word. You're just going to get an email from me for seven days that's going to help you to take a step of faith. You can reply to the email if you want. You don't have to. If you don't reply, you won't hear from me anymore. If you do reply, I'll answer your email. But if you made a decision, no matter where you're watching from, would you please text the word victory, V-I-C-T-O-R-Y, to 989-623-4779. I believe God will use those emails in your life. And again, When you let someone know you made a decision, you're more likely to follow through. Jeff's going to take over now at our Sioux campus. Doug, down in the chapel, here in the main auditorium, would you stand with me? And let's together end our time of worship with this incredible song. First time guests, I look forward to meeting you.